In 1996, Barbara Gruder applied to the University of Michigan Law School. She was a white 43-year-old single mother with an undergraduate GPA of 3.8. She had scored 161 on her LSAT exam, placing her in the 86th percentile nationally. The university first placed her on the law school's wait list, but after several months, she received notice that her application had been denied. She was well qualified for admission to the University of Michigan Law School. She was denied admission. She said that the reason she was denied admission was because others were admitted based on the fact that they were members of racial and ethnic groups that were preferred in the admissions process. So her core claim is that I was denied admission to the University of Michigan Law School because I'm white. Had I been black or Hispanic, with my record, I would have been admitted. This is impermissible constitutionally. This is discrimination based on race, and the program should be um, found unconstitutional. The law school explained that they don't necessarily want everybody to be the same, to be at the same intellectual level. They want different individuals to have exchanges of ideas, and, and in reviewing the candidates for law school admission, they did not focus on any one single variable. They did not focus on race. Even though race was not the only deciding factor when it came to admissions, the University of Michigan Law School had implemented a policy which attempted to admit a critical mass of qualified minority students. The university contended that there was a compelling interest in doing this. The argument for critical mass is one that basically had two parts to it. One, that you needed a sufficient number of underrepresented minorities so that the underrepresented minorities who were there didn't feel like they had to represent their, their race in uh, educational settings like a classroom and so forth. And the second part of that was that um, the um, there should be enough of a representation of uh, minorities to ensure a diversity of opinions even within that particular race so that all students when exchanging arguments and ideas can benefit from as a diverse educational atmosphere as possible. Claiming the school's policy violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, Barbara Gruder filed a class action lawsuit against Lee Bollinger, the president of the University of Michigan. The plaintiffs argued that the critical mass policy was the functional equivalent of a quota. They said this is smoke and mirrors. This is quotas by a different name. And Lewis Powell, the same Lewis Powell on whom Michigan Law School is relying, Lewis Powell said you can't have quotas. And so this is unconstitutional. The district court ruled in Ms. Gruder's favor, saying that the law school's use of race in its admission policy was unconstitutional. The university appealed that decision, arguing its admission system was in compliance with the law according to the Supreme Court's 1978 decision in the Bakke case. The Court of Appeals overturned the district court's decision, concluding that the critical mass policy was acceptable and that the diversity approach, as outlined in Justice Powell's opinion in the Bakke case, was constitutional. Michigan attempted to argue that everything that it was doing fell within the scope of Justice Powell's Bakke theory. Now, of course, the problem that it met was that there was a significant argument going on as to whether Powell really was speaking for a majority of, of the court. On the one hand, a majority of the court had said you can use race as a factor. On the other hand, no one other than Powell had actually endorsed the, uh, the diversity theory itself. After the Court of Appeals had reversed the district court's ruling, Barbara Gruder and her legal team appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Gruder versus Bollinger would be the first time the Supreme Court had dealt with the legality of using race in higher education admission decisions since the Bakke case. 
At the heart of the case was this. If a state university's law school considers race as a factor when deciding which students to admit, is this a violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause or the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Essentially, what the challengers wanted to argue, well, certainly we know that a quota or a set-aside is unconstitutional. The court's been very clear on that. And isn't this critical mass that Michigan purports to be trying to achieve, isn't that simply a thinly disguised quota? What Michigan did, they said this is designed to advance diversity. And diversity under Bakke, according to Lewis Powell, is a compelling state interest. We're not using quotas. We're not saying we will have X number of people. That's what they did at Davis. We are saying that race will be one of those things that we'll consider along with GPA, socioeconomic background, uh, LSAT scores, what you did in college, you know, class president or what have you. Race is one of the things that we will consider to try to make sure that we get a class of students who are broadly representative of the society in which they're going to live. That's what Lewis Powell said was okay. That's what we're doing. In 2003, after both sides had finished their arguments, the decision of the Supreme Court was split, five to four, in favor of the University of Michigan. The majority contended that the critical mass system was not a quota, and that race was only one factor in determining who was and was not admitted to the law school. Writing for the majority, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said the U.S. Constitution does not prohibit the law school's narrowly tailored use of race in admissions decisions to further a compelling interest in obtaining the educational benefits that flow from a diverse student body. However, Justice O'Connor also wrote that the use of racial preferences in the admissions process should eventually come to an end. We take the law school at its word that it would like nothing better than to find a race-neutral admissions formula and will terminate its race-conscious admissions program as soon as practicable. We expect that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary to further the interests that we approve today. Unlike Bakke, there are five justices who agree with the core holding in the case and the reasons given for that holding. So what Gritter does is constitutionalize Bakke. 25 years after Bakke is decided, Gritter comes along and says, Lewis Powell was correct. Justice Powell had concentrated almost exclusively on the internal aspects of diversity, how diversity adds to the classroom process how it adds to the internal educational process. Justice O'Connor, writing for the majority in Grutter, put a lot more emphasis on the external. Her emphasis was that a school like Michigan, a highly selective school, one of the top law schools in the country, uh, is producing the future leaders of the country. And it is crucial that the people at Michigan are interacting in a racially diverse uh, setting, and it is also crucial that they are training a racially div diverse student body. Uh, and that's, that's how the court justified Michigan's selectivity combined with its emphasis on racial diversity. But this decision was not unanimous. In his dissenting opinion, Chief Justice William Rehnquist contended that the law school's critical mass policy amounted to a type of unconstitutional racial balancing and cited the fact that the percentage of minorities admitted to the law school remained relatively consistent from year to year. And Justice Clarence Thomas, himself an African-American, wrote an even more strongly worded dissent. Quoting Justice John Harlan's dissenting opinion in Plessy v. Ferguson and Frederick Douglass, Justice Thomas wrote, Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. It has been nearly 140 years since Frederick Douglass asked the intellectual ancestors of the law school to do nothing with us, and the nation adopted the 14th Amendment. Now we must wait another 25 years to see this principle of equality vindicated. Affirmative action policies are still the cause of debate. In fact, 
Grutter versus Bollinger only temporarily answered the question about the legality of the use of race as a factor in the admissions process in colleges and universities. Recently, the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case of Fisher versus University of Texas, in which Abigail Fisher, an 18-year-old white female, was denied admission to the university. Ms. Fisher is challenging the use of race in the admission process for undergraduates at the university. One might have thought that the battle over uh, affirmative action in education had been completely and fully resolved by the Grutter opinion, that the court had had its say, that it had essentially established the ground rules, and, and uh, that no reason to think that it would be willing to change its mind. So under the circumstances, the only conclusion that one can draw is they must, uh, the, they must, uh, the court must be having some second thoughts about it. There is a fair chance that in the Fisher case, the court will reconsider its decision in Grutter. Now, it could reconsider its decision and overturn Grutter and say that Rehnquist's argument was the correct argument and strike down the University of Texas Affirmative Action Program and all affirmative action programs that are designed to advance diversity. Or it could say that the Texas program in Fisher doesn't provide sufficient individualized review, and therefore it's unconstitutional. That would, at least in name, preserve the Grutter decision, because that was the key to O'Connor's opinion, individualized review, no quotas. But individualized review has, can be viewed in a number of different ways. And if the court is hostile to affirmative action claims, it can narrow what will count as individualized review to the point where nothing really, if race is a factor, will be considered to be uh, individualized review. The 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution promises equal treatment under the law. For the past several decades, courageous citizens from many different backgrounds have worked to make that promise a reality. And we as a nation have come a long way as a result of their efforts.